Inspirational Creatives, episode 235. Welcome to Inspirational Creatives. I'm your host, Rob Lawrence. Join me every Friday as I chat with successful artists, producers, and creative entrepreneurs who share powerful stories and strategies. They can help you to create the life that you want. Listen each week as these inspirational creatives show you how to take your creativity to the next level. You'll learn how to create a sustainable business that inspires others and gives you the financial freedom and lifestyle that you want. Thanks for listening. Make sure you sign up at inspirationalcreatives.com to get free exclusive bonus material. And now on with the show. Rob here and welcome to another episode of Inspirational Creatives. Last year, I took a break from the podcast, and during that time, I had the pleasure of interviewing a number of leaders and fascinating people, and I'd like to share one of those conversations with you today. This particular conversation was recorded in March of last year, 2017, and it was an opportunity presented to me that I didn't want to miss. We talk about doing creative digital business in a slightly different and in a less conventional way, but based upon a model I'm confident you're already familiar with. We're going to talk about a model that creates a sustainable living for artists. So with no further ado, I'd like to rewind time and take you back to almost a year ago. My guest today is somebody who supports and empowers artists towards creating a sustainable career through democratic business. She is the CEO and co-founder of an online artist-owned co-op called Stocksy United that specialises in high-end curated stock photography. Having worked as an executive in the stock industry for over 10 years, mentoring startups in Canada, Korea, Japan and the US, with a focus on using community and curation to lead companies forward in photography, art and music, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today, Brianna Wetlaufer. Brianna, welcome. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. For those yet to meet you, Brianna, how would you describe who it is that you are and what it is that you do in the world today? <laughs> starting with a heavy one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the angle that I bring in in my career is a really well-rounded background from both a creative side, a business side, and community development, which means I'm, I'm very focused on product development and um, the utmost integrity behind it. I have a, a design and marketing background to, to really push that side. And then on the business side, you know, coming from tech and computers and, and working in startups is I bring, I think, a unique level of, of pragmatism, um, having also coming from the, the creative side as well, which is, you know, making sure that we're always making the smartest decisions for the business to move as quickly as possible, to be as, you know, agile as possible so that we can continue to, to innovate and, and make really cool creative things. And doing that with a focus on, you know, having a community that that creates that product and, and comes together to support and, and mentor and, and hopefully make, you know, meaningful friendships that will last a lifetime. I love that. I'd love to get into the community and uh, the, the friendship stuff that you just mentioned there. Uh, but before I do, I love this blend that you have between technology and creativity. Has that always been true for you? I was definitely born a nerd, <laughs> but I come from a long line of artists. My mom was a painter and um, sign letters and musicians. And um, I, I had kind of the polar opposite um, growing up experience, I think, from a lot of people, which is I was actually forced quite heavily into focusing on on my artistic abilities to the point where I was like, you know what, I I'm, this is my life. <laughs> I want to approach it my way. And I was always really fascinated by um, the sciences and early on, you know, being introduced to computers that was just like I gravitated to it really heavily. So it was kind of a full circle into figuring out my obsession with computers, how I brought it back into the creative side, which ended up being um, graphic design. But yeah, it actually came later and, and the nerdiness came first. Mm, I love that. That sounds really exciting. And I love the fact that you had a, a almost a, a slightly different lifestyle to many people, which is you were encouraged with your creativity and perhaps your curiosity there in that sense. Um, so what was growing up like for you, given that? It's actually probably a strong reason why I ended up being so pragmatic is <laughs> um, having, being surrounded by a bunch of artists who, you know, had very airy ideas and, you know, <laughs> floated around things and, um, you know, followed their feelings a lot. It was like I, I kind of backlashed against it and it was like, no, we need to organize. We need structure. Mm. We need process. <laughs> There's an order in how we can do these things. So it's going to be you know, the strongest <laughs> result. So I don't think I fit in very well, quite honestly. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you've clearly got a creative streak. I mean, I've seen some of your work and like your eye for design and fashion and photography is is clearly quite unique. Um, so how did you find your passion for design and photography? Yeah, I've uh, always kind of also had an obsession with photography, I would say, from an early age. So, you know, as a, a kid, I was collecting magazines and I had like boxes of, of different categories of pictures that I would clip out and I would keep like scrapbooks of pictures that inspired me. And, and that was as a teenager. And once I started getting into graphic design, I was basically taking time to try and like memorize all these stock photo libraries and, and really understand the, the influence of what imagery had and the message and takeaway. And I was definitely drawn to, to simplicity of something that could so easily be overlooked, but when you really make it stand out, it has such a you know strong impact. So yeah, I was always always really focused on that. And getting into photography was something that kind of happened by accident, which was, you know, running a, a blog in, you know, early 2000, I started, you know, interviewing a ton of photographers, and they kind of slowly pushed me into it. And then I ended up working for a stock photography agency. And basically, it just, yeah, it became my life. That's amazing. So tell me a little bit more about that that latter part of the journey there where you ended up working for the agency mm -hmm. what was the sequence of events how did that all unfold yeah so as the photographers were pushing me to to you know explore my photography for myself um stumbled across iStock I, I think through a blog and um just coming into a community of people during a time when photography was you know kind of becoming democratized and, and accessible through all the digital cameras that were coming out it was was a lot of people that were in a similar place, I think, from where I was coming from, which is designers who always had the secret love, but were figuring out how to develop their styles as photographers. So, yeah, I got really obsessive and involved. And um, yeah, I think my level of like really wanting to help um, ended up connecting with the founder and um, getting a job offer and picking up and moving from Victoria, BC to Calgary. Amazing. And who was that job offer with? Uh, that was with iStock. That's amazing. So they offered you a job. I did. Yeah. I originally came in, um, like I said, I was running a blog at the time. So I was originally hired as, as a writer to help kind of get um, a, a social presence presence off the ground. But like I said, I was just so intrigued by all facets of this business that was in its early growth stages that I ended up, you know, becoming heavily involved in how the community was developing, what the user experience was, the tone of, of marketing and running events. And, and then my main job was looking at how we created standards and aesthetic to kind of begin to hone and evolve um, the collection that was happening at iStock. So working with the, the editor team and growing that to about, I think it was 75 people before I left. That must have been quite involving. What were some of the challenges for you growing that team? Probably the same challenges as, you know, any large group of people where you're dealing with people internationally with varying cultures is how do you be cohesive? So really making sure you have a, a clear vision that's shared with everybody and the communication channels to make sure everybody kind of maintains that brain meld so that they're they're moving as a unit towards, you know, a, a bigger purpose. You mentioned integrity earlier, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what that means to you. But in terms of actually keeping some consistency within that team, you know, keeping a consistency of perhaps the vision. Mm -hmm. What do you think the key to doing that successfully was for you? I'll say something that a lot of people who I work with um, probably don't agree with. <laughs> and that's, I think no matter how big you are, you can't sacrifice the quality of being hands-on and taking things individually for the sake of, of automation. So um, mm. the same thing at Stocksy, working with the teams, it's, you know, just train them and then, you know, never look back. It's a constant process of reviewing and adapting. So every, mm. every file that gets reviewed today um, we also go back as a team and look at all the declines that happened. We review everything's coming in and we try and pick out kind of trends that are happening with the community, trends that are happening from the editors and how they're talking to the community, trends that probably as a collective whole we could address and, and be improved. Or, um, But yeah, really taking the time to, to work with each editor individually as part of that collective whole, I think is is what keeps things really tight and you have to be willing to kind of spend that that extra time to do that. 
Yeah, I love that. So it's not just about simply communicating an idea and getting a consistent message out there. It's actually about rolling your sleeves up, working with these people day in and day out and exchanging your philosophy in that way. Definitely. And always asking and, and questioning what you've just done to, to make sure, like, is there room to improve um, from, from any direction? get very very bold with when things just maintain a status quo so they always need to be getting better <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when things start to even out it's time to shake things up again exactly <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I want to ask you about Stocksy United. I'm dying to ask you more about that. But before I do, I want to come back to this point about integrity, which you mentioned earlier. I'd love to know what that means to you. It's something you mentioned a couple of times just a moment ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think for me, with my experience through various businesses, like when I start to feel the integrity is starting to, to weaken or, or get lost, it's when that long term vision of what it is you're working towards starts to get sacrificed for how can you make money quicker or how can you just focus on on numbers to to get a reaction um, at a consequence of you know losing your your voice or the soul behind the business or, or brand I think it's integrity is is being willing to say no in order to focus on what you feel is the strongest voice and, and has the biggest purpose and mm. yeah looking long term yeah, I love that. And and what would you say sits behind integrity in that sense? Is it courage or something like that, perhaps? <laughs> Losing your ego is definitely a good step. Because <laughs> mm. I think that tends to, to get in the way of you seeing yourself as an individual against um, what the, the bigger picture is. So if you can't take feedback of how you maintain the integrity of what you're doing by, you know, getting constructive feedback, harsh criticism, you know, maybe even things that you, you disagree with, but you remaining open um, so that you can t- continue to be malleable and, you know, evolving, I think is a crucial piece. Yeah, I really like that. This idea of letting go of your ego, which particularly in a tech and a creative world, I I imagine for some people is is, is quite a challenge having to let go of ideas that they've fallen in love with, perhaps. For sure. I I think you just have to be excited about those challenging conversations and, you know, being able to come to an understanding with all those different perspectives so that you can possibly end up with something totally different from from where you started. Mm. So let's talk about that in the context of Stocksy and what it is and what it means to you and and how it works in the world today? Well, I think Stocksy exists because we were trying to address what was happening in mid-2010 um, in the stock industry, which is the stock world as a whole kind of had become stuck in a moment um, and people were becoming uninspired. And I think they were also feeling a, a strong loss of power that was echoing into the, the work that they were creating and, and their financial stability. So um, I think Stocksy represents putting that power and control back into the artist's hands and yeah, working with a large scale agency and, and membership in order to compete against the, the bigger brands to create, I think, sustainable sustainable careers is is our long-term goal. Yeah. And what, what do you believe is at the key of that? I mean, particularly for creative people to create a sustainable career is, is, is almost a dream come true in many respects. So what do you think the key is to it for freelancers and for artists in terms of meaningfully trying to achieve that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I would say it's a, a complicated answer given that there's a lot of flux happening and, and change and even where marketing is shifting these days has has a lot of variances at the moment, the whole economic status around the world. Yes. Um, but I think as an artist, if, if you want to make a go of, of you know, treating it as your professional career, it, it is having that focus of this is a career, which means putting in full-time hours, looking at who your audience is, the, the same way any business would set itself up is, you know, who am I trying to sell to? What are their needs? How do I best serve that? How do I stand out against everybody else who's doing the same thing to, to have a unique voice? And looking at how you market yourself, I think is also really important because I think the quickest thing most people do when they are looking to work with somebody is, well, what's your online brand presence? And, and if you have none, or if you have a website that's, you know, still flash from early 2000 that you haven't updated, <laughs> people have a very low attention span to try and figure out how to learn more about you. So yeah, treating it just as you would any other business, your art is a business and, and yeah, you have to have the focus and of what it is you're trying to achieve to do that. 
Yeah. And what do you believe the key is to being able to market yourself in an authentic way, but also in a professional way these days? Yeah. So I see a lot of approaches from artists and and what they're doing. And I think making sure that when you're using social media or setting up your, your website is that your voice really is present. So especially in, you know, Facebook, Instagram, that you're not just reposting what you're doing elsewhere because people are likely already aware of it or it comes across like you're just making a product placement, which I think with authenticity, people are quite sensitive to now is mm. they expect things to, to be much more naturally um, presented to them versus kind of pushed at them. Mm. So approaching to how you did it, why people should care, giving, giving that backstory and that reinforces why you're unique and, and people want to work with you or follow you or have a conversation even. Yeah. So it's about your why in some respects there, what I'm hearing. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, overall, I think there's an interesting shift in business in general, which is that that's kind of there's a lot of articles coming up is it's not just about having a job, but it's knowing being able to answer that why question, knowing what you're you're looking for as a purpose in your career and an outcome. Yeah, absolutely. So with a why in mind, then why a co-op model? Can you tell me about how does a co-op model work and, and how does that help artists create a sustainable career in that sense? Definitely. Um, well, yeah, coming back to shifts towards ethical businesses, the co-op has been around for hundreds of years. And in order to achieve those goals of, of ethics, it's ensuring transparency and reporting. It's ensuring engagement. It's ensuring that people have the power to vote on operations that will affect them. It's being able to have resolutions, basically all the tools and education in order to make informed decisions and recommendations for the business and at the same time having control and a fair equity or profit sharing model that is benefiting the most amount of people. So we get asked if, you know, everything should all become a co-op and, you know, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of a, a diversity of, of styles, but um, the co-op, it, it's been around, it's it's now getting reinvented in this online setting. And it, it, yeah, I think it, it's a solid model that ensures all of those things are met and are supported by your membership. Yeah, that's fascinating. So you mentioned the fact that co-ops have been around for a long time now mm -hmm. in the world of commerce. What's different about the co-ops of today compared to the co-ops of yesterday in, in your view? Sure. Yeah, I think we're at a really interesting point with where co-ops are going, where you're We've been having lots of, you know, fantastic conversations with a lot of the, the associations and um, like incubators and people supporting what's happening in, in the cooperative space. And kind of the general consensus that we're feeling from everyone is that they're ready for a shift, which is kind of been coined as the, the platform co-op, which is taking, you know, the existing model, which normally was you know, used for, for agriculture, uh, banking, and shifting it into the online space where you have these collectives of people and communities around the world. And you're, you're seeing that as it's being discussed, you know, with Uber and, and Facebook is there's these incredibly strong communities, but they don't have any influence or power or even fair profit sharing coming back to them. So it's you know, shifting that power in a way that more people can start benefiting and, you know, all of this wealth that is not being, you know, distributed start coming back in so that more people can be autonomous and, and financially stable. And yeah, it, it seems like we're just at the cusp of the bylaws and, and governance structures being adapted there where this could, I think, really take off for a lot of businesses. Yeah, fascinating. Um, without giving too much away, obviously, uh, what have you been doing to help shift that power balance in that sense yeah we we take hearing our community i think incredibly seriously we are basically constantly in a conversation with them we're not in the forums as much as i think um, we would like to be or our community would like to be um, but there's constantly conversations happening behind the scenes and attending events and and getting as much information as we can to help bring that back into the community and and continue to to talk about how how we innovate the model that, that we're trying to do at the moment. But, you know, I think as a whole, we, all the people that work at Stocksy are incredibly vested in focusing on 
how do we help our artists become successful? So, you know, when we're hiring, it's, it's anybody who has a whiff of like wanting to cash out, <laughs> we'll make it here. Cause we don't, we don't have time for that. So I think a lot of people, they might have a community manager or, or pockets of people that are having conversations with, with their membership, but really it's all of us are, are constantly taking in feedback and opinions and gauging where the direction is. How do we best meet their needs and applying that to, to how we move forward as a business? So the community manager role in some sense is kind of adopted by all of you. Yeah, we uh, well, having hung out in, in forums for, you know, a long time, <laughs> um, <laughs> they... The thing we really wanted to make sure that we didn't do was where we're trying to have this democratic structure is bring in this authoritarian voice who kind of talks down to everybody and, and manages everybody's opinion. It was, well, how do we how do we all talk to each other as adults? And, the, you know, having one person oversee that just didn't feel like the right fit. But everybody speaking to the thing that they are experts on to, to have those meaningful conversations with everybody seemed like the best approach for us. Yeah, that's fascinating. We've mentioned community and communication there. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to learn more about the subtle ways that you're communicating with your community these days. I mean, social media and events, as you've mentioned, spring to mind. But Mm -hmm. how are you actually doing that? a more detailed level. Yeah, it's definitely one of the things or one of the challenges that has kind of been ongoing as as we scale, because as I said, most we're basically the the leads in all the departments are speaking directly to the community, which means they're often really busy. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, so sometimes it's it's a challenge to be able to kind of wrangle all the information to, to put it into a package to, to share. But yeah, we have, you know, monthly um, member emails that kind of give all the, the breakdowns on what earnings were and, and all the analytics. It's what key things are happening um, to, you know, move our product forward as a business. It's what partnerships we're working at. So anything we're doing that has an effect on what they're doing, we always make sure that that we're communicating that. And, and then always looking, trying to stay kind of ahead of you know, what things are going to be on the horizon by bringing those conversations into the the forums and and letting those have enough breathing space and room, I think, for everybody to really hash them out and come to the same page before we make any major decisions. Yeah, sure. And through that dialogue and conversation, you mentioned, you know, keeping an eye on the different trends that emerge. Mm-hmm. What have been some of the bigger trends that you've seen emerged in the time that you've you've been working with uh, Stocks United? Yeah, yeah. This has kind of been um, growing as a focus for us. Um, you know, first starting around 2012, it was a much different space that I think is, you know, we've been waiting to see kind of a monumental shift in styles, but it's, you know, as usual, quite gradual. But where we started was that really strong influence, I think, from Instagram culture and, you know, kind of figuring out what authenticity and, and a visual approach meant. And, it was a lot of documenting lifestyles and, but it kind of reached this point, I think of beginning to make people feel disenfranchised and like they were doing their lives wrong. And it was no longer, I think, inspiring to to look at because it was people who had lots of time to curate how they were approaching things. And then lots of people who are too busy to do that. And yeah, the, the color palettes and, and everything, all those filters we're definitely a, a very specific time and place. And I think now we're moving into moving away from that. It, the new millennials driving the new, their new visual aesthetics. And we're seeing a big shift, I think, where instead of the muted gray skies of the Pacific Northwest, like it's becoming much stronger, bolder color choices and having impact there where there's this anti-saturation movement. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and I think with everything, with how heavy everything's going on, it's, you know, we are constantly becoming more sophisticated with how we interpret the things that we're looking at and and what they mean to us. So it's ensuring that we're representing people in a way that is inclusive to the most amount of people. We're showing more diversity. I think there's definitely shifts in people's ideals on, on beauty and, you know, representing different cultures, as well as I think with the, the color movement, it's just I think we want some life and fun and vibrancy after being weighted down by <laughs> for the last few years. 
so yeah, that's where I'm seeing things head at the moment. And we're trying to bring that into the Stocksy collection right now. That's really fascinating, actually, to think that maybe as time unfolds even further over decades, you can actually look back at collections of images at certain times to see if they're reflecting what's going on in the world at that point in time and how people are feeling about Definitely. the world at that time. Definitely. Yeah, I love that. Do you feel from a quality point of view? Because, I mean, really, there's on the one hand, there's no excuse for not being able to produce high quality these days, but with so much ease i suppose in being able to create something of quality and with so many people doing it these Mm -hmm. days it must be terribly tough for uh, individuals i suppose to be able to compete if that's the right word in terms of getting heard or seen Mm -hmm. what do you see some of the big challenges now for folks within your co-op community so we have a a membership cap of a thousand um, which we're kind of hovering at right now And that was a deliberate choice because at other agencies, there is no cap. They can have as many artists as they want. And what we saw happening there was people began fighting over pennies, basically, um, in terms of um, sales, Mm -hmm. as well as they were actively cannibalizing and copying each other and and regurgitating the same stuff. So, yeah, you were literally taking kind of the same photo from 10 different perspectives and trying to get one sale out of it. So, by having the membership cap, we really intentionally hand chosen everybody in our membership to try and not choose people that are pitted in competition in style and tone. Everybody we bring on, it's a question of, is this going to expand what we're offering in the collection so that people can focus on being supportive of each other and, and not competitive? But in terms of being able to stand out, I, I think it's there's higher competition now, but I think it's the, the same issue, which is if you want to be an artist or I can speak to being a, a photographer, it, it's really knowing what your unique voice is that separates you from everybody else. So when we're looking at applications, there, there's definitely portfolios that are really strong, but they haven't quite found their tone of voice it's it you know they're bouncing around with all you know different styles and and they're still experimenting trying to figure out you know where they fall and it's it's when you figure that out that i think you you find your sweet spot and and can really stand out in the crowd yeah uncovering who that voice Mm is and 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 using that as a way of standing out amongst the crowd i suppose i I didn't know that about the cap and that's fascinating Mm -hmm. to me has that enabled you to have a deeper relationship with your community Definitely. Yeah, I I would say a lot of us intimately know a lot of people out of the membership. (laughs) And and that's not by accident either. Yeah, it um, allows us to have, I think, much more focused conversations. Um, It allows us to work with them one on one. Um, Our editors are take a very hands on approach as well. Um, They're doing hangouts with our membership. And, um, and it allows us, I think, to scale sustainably as a business where if we tried to grow too fast, you know, once you kind of get past a certain threshold it's very hard to work backwards from so yeah we've definitely approached it deliberately with with that goal of having that that hands-on feel where everybody feels like a person and not lost in a sea of other people and I guess like any community, you're going to have individuals that are more active than others. Um, have you seen much churn in terms of your community, you know, people moving on and bringing fresh talent into your into mm-hmm. your goals? Yeah, I, I think that's actually something we're really looking at right now is how many people are treating being a contributor with us as a, a full-time job? And we're looking at, you know, what balance do we need in order to be a successful product? And up until this point, you know, with the kind of focus on inclusivity, we've actually chosen not to actively take anybody out of the membership unless they've just absolutely not uploaded anything, like zero. <laughs> then we'll take those, free up those spots to, to somebody else that is more interested. But there's people sitting with, with smaller portfolios. And, and yeah, we, we never wanted to push anybody away. But I think now as we're maturing as a business, we're, we're looking at what our membership means probably a bit more pragmatically to, to mature and, and become more, more sophisticated with how our members are directly driving what our product is versus, um, I, I guess, a bit more of a, a passive approach, hoping that it would support it while we focus on business. So bringing those things back closer together, I think, is our big focus for 2017. So with that in mind, then, what are some of the benefits of your membership or your community of being part of that co-op in terms of you nurturing other people's artistic talent in that sense? 
the membership cap is um, definitely going to have um, an influence of what your experience is going to be like um, because we're a co-op, because we're all in this together, we're all in the same team. The culture of interactions brings, I think, a much more open um, and receptive community of people wanting to help everybody. By being with Stocksy, you have direct contact basically to anybody, um, which I think is is fairly unique. You're working with a team of people at, at headquarters who all bring photography, design, video backgrounds, worked in the industry. They've come from other agencies. They've come out of communities. So we bring, I think, um, a fairly empathetic approach to making sure we're working with them in the ways that we have always hoped um, other agencies worked with us in, in our past careers. That's fascinating. So do you actively encourage mentoring or do you see passive mentoring going on uh, in the co-op? Um, yeah, there's there's constant conversations of, you know, what people are trying, what what gear they're looking at. And I would say the, the bigger mentorship probably happens as um, meetups start to form or in locations around mm. the world. Typically what we see is once you meet somebody in person, the conversation you can have with them when you return to the forums or go, you know, chat with them through whatever program, it, it become, takes a much different thing. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, it's a, it, there's something different about meeting someone in person and the way that conversation then changes when you regroup back online afterwards. Definitely. It's kind of like a train to guess what their voice is going to sound like. And then you hear it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then you hear their voice when you see them write something up online. And it's never the but same. It's never the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating. I'm, I'm learning so much here, Brianna. This is, this is really, really exciting for me. So we've spoken about perhaps some of the challenges for folks within your co-op. Um, but what are some of the challenges for you personally running the co-op? And where do you see the challenges going forward? from this point in time right now oh geez <laughs> big question i appreciate that yeah definitely well my role has definitely evolved a lot in my time here when we first started in our first year i was basically hands-on in everything that we were doing from working with our dev teams to kind of architect um, how we were going to build the site, um, what the UI was going to look like. I was handling the marketing and social media. So yeah, it was very hands-on and working directly with the editor team every day. And of course, you know, as we've grown as a business, we've gone from four people huddled around a picnic table to about 25 people in our office and um, full-time people as contractors. So of course there's, I, I can't be hands-on anymore. And that's definitely been a process for me of, you know, having a very strong creative vision and, and really wanting it to be, you know, just so. And but being able to articulate that with um, all of our teams so that, you know, we're discussing what the goal of the vision is. And then everybody has that autonomy and empowerment to to drive it as a department to, to get there. And I think learning how to do that, scaling and Trying to, I think even internally, we've tried to maintain things being as democratic as they can from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, so I hate, I'm kind of starting to hate the idea of this thing called flat hierarchy. But the latest mm -hmm. thing I heard is a dynamic hierarchy where, you know, power dynamics can shift based on who has the most expertise in the moment. And the teams form around the projects that, that need to be done. And um, just, I think, as a whole, always making sure that from the inside out that we always respect every perspective and opinion um, as we approach the projects that, that we're trying to work on where everybody from in the, the inside out feels respected, I think is, is a really big one and figuring out how to do that as, as we scale and turn teams from one person into, you know, five. And then in my role, just kind of getting a little bit more and more removed, but trying to stay as connected as I can to not lose kind of that thread of where we started and, and what we're working towards. It's, it's a constant balance. And sometimes I move too far away from some things and I have to figure out how to get back there, giving up the other thing that was probably not as important for me to be focused on. Yeah, every day, every day I get a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple of things I'd love to ask you about that. First, yeah, how do you restore that balance when you realize it's tipping one way or the other? What sort of steps do you take to restore that balance? Yeah, um, let's see. Right now, I kind of shifted into probably more of a 
making sure that the functions of each department were being productive and became less focused on the the more creative side of the business, um, which of course was, wasn't a great move for me. (laughs) So yeah, making sure that we hire people that I can work with and and collaborate with. And I feel extremely lucky for the, the people that we have. So it's, yeah, finding the right people and playing to all the right strengths. And if you have to, sometimes you need to hire somebody to bring that balance so that you can focus and return your focus elsewhere. And then as we're scaling, like I said, it's it's a lot of articulating expectations and aesthetics and, and goals, I think in a written form where you're not interpreting opinions, but you everybody understands this is you know exactly what we're trying to do. It's not personal to anybody. This is the high level goal of the business. When you approach it from that place, it brings it back to, well, we're all working towards the same thing and we can all kind of work together and reform teams in order to to drive that. And in my role, I get I think I guess I get the luxury of, of bouncing around from department to department to to get to participate in that. Uh, yeah, and so you keep your finger on the pulse as best you can, I suppose, in terms of what's happening in all aspects of the co-op. Definitely. I wanted to go back just very briefly about what you mentioned there. I'm really glad you brought it up about the sort of flat hierarchy thing because it's something that I, I'm starting to hear more and more in various different circles. And I was interested in what your thoughts were about that and how you see that being managed. Because one of the big questions I have about that type of structure is where does the buck stop? You know, how, how does somebody take authority when a key decision needs to be made? And I think you may have scratched the surface or alluded to it just a moment ago by sort of saying, you know, something about who's got the expertise in that particular area. Uh, but I'd love to know your thoughts on on that and, and how you're managing that within a co-op type of environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely been one of the more interesting conversations lately. In the beginning, we were trying to move towards being flat by basically not having any middle management and then having people that were executives, but that were there to empower the teams and the teams themselves were all accountable to each other. And the, for us, that was trying to keep things as, as flat as we could. But I think especially as we're growing and the teams are getting bigger, it's if we're all accountable to each other, being accountable all at the same time makes it very hard to know, you know, who, who is the final decision maker? And are you assuming that the rest of the team is, is doing something that you all collectively agreed to? And I think sort of like capitalism has a really bad name, but you know, it's the same thing for us. We want to make money for our members. <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. We just need to, to refocus how we approach it and you know how we achieve that. So same thing with hierarchy. I don't think has to be a, a bad word and it doesn't have to be a literal stack from the top down. Cause that's definitely not what we want, but I think you always want clear paths of communication and process so that everybody feels respected. Everybody knows the structure in which they can perform their jobs and they're not having to guess. And that there's somebody who is a driver for every project so that you don't want an entire team stressing out about how you're going to do something or how you reinvent or adapt. It's that's a stressful thing that can stress an entire team out. And by saying that nobody's in charge, well, basically you're saying, okay, everybody gets to share that stress. And I don't think that's actually helpful. Yeah. So yeah, but having, you know, executive level staff where their focus isn't to manage how people are doing things, dictate or be authoritative, but they're there to ensure that there's clarity and definition so that they can empower the teams to get there in, in an autonomous way. That's where we're at right now within stocks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Now that sounds really great. What I've learned there and what I'm hearing there, which is quite fresh to me in some respects, is it's it's more about having accountability through process and having people manage the accountability of activities rather than actual micromanaging people in that sense. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, if something doesn't work, somebody does have to be accountable for the decisions that are made. And is it best to have an entire team do that or or is it best to have one person be able to focus on it to ensure that happens? So leaning towards the latter, I think, as being a, a much more healthy approach. Yeah. And something you said earlier there about having the right sort of person. And I imagine in the environment that you've described, it sounds like you've got people who listen really well in that sense. They're in touch with what people are saying and what their feelings and opinions are about certain things. And I guess when you've got people in leadership type roles, if I can call it that, they're, they're sensitive to that. And so hopefully that they're making decisions with their concerns in mind. 
Definitely. Yeah. Same as, you know, listening to our membership, we, we bring that same approach. And I think for us, we've tried to create a culture of we're trying to get to our goals as quickly as possible, which means there's not a lot of time to, to candy coat things. So yes. it's like, well, maybe <laughs> um, this is great, but <laughs> and I, I find that in general to be a bit condescending. And yeah, so it's typically an adjustment when, when people start with us, which is there are very aggressive opinions being brought to, I think, every meeting where we're reviewing what's going on. And uh, even as a co-op, I think everybody expects it to be kind of a bit flowery and everybody telling everybody how great they are. But no, it's <laughs> it's it's a business. And yeah, we're trying to make the best product possible. And we've definitely focused on hiring people that can adapt well into that culture and it's it's not a fit for everybody and I think that's okay but for the people that really love challenging each other it's it's an awesome place to be (laughs) (laughs) that's fascinating yeah that aggression then comes from a place of urgency to to reach a goal but passion as well definitely passion driven yeah if you're just instigating trouble or or again coming from a a place of ego because you want to validate your own opinion it's not going to work well and typically gets picked out fairly quickly yeah which begs me to ask the question which i'm sure there's no easy answer but at a high level how do you find the right people yeah well it's definitely an an interesting problem being based out of Victoria, BC, you know, being a, a smaller island and now being looked at as one of the fastest growing, you know, tech sectors in Canada is it's definitely highly competitive where we are. And you basically have to, I think, look outside of the city. We we try as best as we can to, to start here. But I think for us, we can't plan a lot of the times to know when we need some, like what role we're going to hire next. It's often just constantly talking to people and, you know, somebody comes along who it's like, you didn't know they were everything that you needed (laughs) in order to raise the the intelligence level in the room. And um, I think for us, it's looking for now people who are much more specialized versus generalized so that yeah, we take these specialized areas and and make them that much more sophisticated. It's a constant challenge. I think that's probably the same for any startup. Yeah. And, you know, more practically, how do you go about actually beginning to find those people? Is it a case of jumping on social media like LinkedIn and places like that? Or or how do you go about it? Yeah, often it's it's word of mouth Mm. um, and just constantly staying connected with people and, you know, talking about where we're at. I I think we tend to be really open as a company to talk about what's working and and what's not working and what we're up to. And and that's led to a lot of people contacting us with these amazing backgrounds who are looking to work for a company that they can feel good about and that supports artists. That's been a huge reason we've been able to acquire some of the people that we have. Yeah, fascinating. What sort of suggestions and ideas would you give to someone looking to be part of a co-op community like yours? What sort of things could they be thinking about or doing that would prepare them well for that type of environment? Hmm, Interesting. Coming from a, a producer end of being a part of the community. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to be ready to be accountable to, to the business. Um, accountability as a co-op, I think is a a hugely important piece to them being to a co-op to be successful. You have to want to be a part of a community. Um, if you bring in, you know, a fairly self-serving attitude, which of course you want your own personal success and stability, but if you're willing to take that to the expense of others, um, you're probably not going to meld in, into the community very well where it's this constant collaborative discussion of, of what's happening as business. You're looking to support the most amount of people possible. But of course, again, looking out for yourself, you, I think need to, it's not mandatory, but being ready and and willing to participate in the business discussions, wanting to read and and be informed as an active member is also going to be really important. I think, you know, every co-op knows that there's going to be a certain amount of people that they just want to do their jobs and and not have to, they don't necessarily always want to be involved in, in that process, but a healthy co-op can only handle so many of those people and, and it's every co-op's goal to figure out how they can be as engaged with people, as many people as possible. So wanting to be engaged in the business and in the community is, is definitely going to be one of the key things in joining a co-op. Yeah. So it's all about engagement and having a passion to be part of that community rather than just being there for yourself in that sense. Definitely. Like, 
the co-op set up so that you have ownership and, and a shift of power back to you. So if those things don't interest you, then a co-op might not be a good choice for you. <laughs> That's helpful to know. That's really good. Yeah, I love that. Great. So before we wrap up then, in the context of everything that we've spoken about today, is there anything you'd like to add? I think the more people that can be supporting all of us, supporting each other so that we can have fairer profit sharing, be helping support all of, you know, artists coming together to support each other as um, a whole in terms of success. I think as we all come together and, and are focused on kind of the pragmatic issues of how we do that as a business, the faster we're, we're going to get there. And I think there's there's a lot of things to, to figure out right now. So the more people we can have involved to make change, the better. Yeah. And with that in mind, out of curiosity, really, you mentioned success there. What does success look like for you today? Um, I mean, I, I think we're really happy with with the success that that we've seen over the last year. Um, we're lucky enough to to close at over um, ten million dollars last year um, USD um, and paying out over fifty percent of that back to our artists. You know, of course, we want to continue to grow and be competitive, but yeah, success for us is creating a, a healthy company that supports our artists and is creating as many, I think, sustainable careers for artists as we can. So we've got more to figure out and we're, I think, focusing down on it more in, in 2017 to make sure we're, we're walking that walk. And what's inspired you recently? Uh, two places are really inspiring me lately. Mm. Um, Australia, I think, is doing incredible things um, from the two things I love, um, art, design and, and co-ops. Um, they've got um, an amazing association behind them, um, helping co-ops innovate there. And then this amazing design community that I think has this very dynamic depth to it that I has maybe become a bit lost in other places as so sort of like just focusing on a one size fits all. But I feel like when you look to Australian design, it's this understanding that it's so embedded in your your lifestyle and in everything that you do. And the conversation is very encompassing towards that. So yeah, they're always inspiring. And the same for the Netherlands. We're we're seeing really inspiring work coming out of there and Sometimes I think things can can feel a bit stagnant. And um, yeah, those are those are the two places where if I want to feel challenged and see things mixed up a bit, that's where I'm getting my most inspiration. A nice surprise to hear that the Netherlands is inspiring you in that sense. My wife is actually half Dutch. Okay. So uh, what is it about the Netherlands that's um, particularly inspiring you? For being small, they, they pack a big punch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as a whole, graphic design, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of templates kind of take over where every site is is looking the same. And I'm seeing design agencies like really challenging that, it, you know, we don't have to all have that same template of, you know, in huge scrolling and, and giant hero images, but that we can continue to, to play with things and and the other piece I'm seeing a lot of is um, illustrators and actual artists making an impact in, in where graphic design and, and marketing is headed. And so, yeah, amazing artists and typographers and a huge font geek. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, the, those are the, the big things that, yeah, that they're just standing out against everybody else globally. Yeah. That's really great. That's really exciting. Yeah, great. And um, more personally for you, you know, what are you grateful for today? The amount of things I think we're balancing with where we are and, and even having arrived at where we are, um, I think when we first started, we believed in it and we wanted it to be a success, but we had so many things kind of working against us of, you know, trying to break into a competitive industry, proving ourselves as a co-op, which actually we had to kind of work twice as hard, I think, to prove our, our product and professionalism because of the stigma associated with co-ops. And then seeing this membership actually work and be as vested as it is in, in working together with us to, to form this business, seeing that that come together and, and to be able to make the amount of money that we've had for our members and figuring out these very fun challenges with where we are is something, yeah, eternally grateful for, for, for being able to be here. That's amazing. Yeah. So what's next for you then, Brianna, uh, in terms of taking things forward? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as mentioned, we're, we're hovering around our, our membership cap and we're custom building all of these tools to live up to the engagement on the co-op side. And I 
I think what's next is how do we be able to expand that, expand what types of artists we're, we're working with and continue to reform the, the processes and of business engagement and, and working with communities in order to, to come out successful. Fabulous. And where can our listener find out more about you, your work, and of course, Stocksy? Right. Um, so you can find us at stocksy.com. So S-T-O-C-K-S-Y. Um, and yeah, so you can find us on Instagram and Facebook, uh, typically at Stocksy United. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Brianna. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for listening. Nothing beats the stories and advice of an expert to help you raise your creative game. I would love to know what you thought about today's episode, so don't forget to subscribe in iTunes where you can rate and review the show. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it on Facebook or Twitter with the one person you know who will benefit from the wisdom shared here today. You can find the show notes on inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash podcast. If you have a burning question or a great idea for a guest, head on over to inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash contact where you can connect with me there. 